Hi, my name is Katie Fisher, and I'm the Senior Centered Occupational Therapist. And I'm Dr. Katie, the Senior Centered Physical Therapist. So today we are going to be talking about memory. So when I say I'm going to give you three words, and I want you to repeat those words to me and then try to remember them later, some of you might start to panic, right? That dreaded memory test that we've probably experienced in the doctor's office recently if you've been to your primary care doctor. And for a lot of us, that is nerve wracking. And the idea of memory loss in general can be very nerve wracking. So today we're going to talk about not just memory, but how we form memory, the different types of memory, and then what can we do for memory. Physical therapists do work somewhat with memory, but really that comes down to occupational therapists and your speech and language pathologist or your speech therapist. So today I am just going to ask Katie Fisher, our resident senior centered occupational therapist, some questions about memory. And you can also check out more information and more articles and links as well in our article on our blog at www.theseniorcenteredpt.com or www.theseniorcenteredot.com. Okay, Katie Fisher. My first question is I think it's important to kind of go back and think about not just how we fix our memory, but what memory are we trying to work on and kind of what are the different types of memory and, and where are they stored in the brain? So first question is what are the types of memory? Great question. Um, so when we're thinking about memory, oftentimes there are three classifications and those are based upon duration. So long-term memory, right, is the ability to store and recall long lasting events, um, which can last a lifetime, right? So maybe you're able to recall your third grade birthday party, right? That would be considered a long-term memory. Short-term memory um, is to be able to recall very recent um, events um, or situations, such as uh, information in a doctor's office. You know, when we talked about those three words, that would be classified as short-term memory. It kind of stays in um, your mind for a couple of seconds. Um, and then oftentimes um, it doesn't get stored into long-term memory. And then within short-term memory is what's called working memory. Um, and so a great example of working memory is if you are about to make a phone call and you're trying to recall the phone number over and over again, as you're trying to dial um, the number. Um, so you can think about as you're, you're utilizing, you're thinking about that situation or um, that event and you're kind of over and over in your brain. And um, that's considered a part of your short-term memory. Okay, so my working memory then is kind of taking the information I just heard and and using it for another purpose, not just like I heard it and it's gone. It's, oh, I, I need to use this within the next couple of minutes maybe. So that's why I'm repeating the phone number. Yes. Okay. And I think you oftentimes think about um, if you were studying, right? Uh, students, when we were studying for a test and you are, maybe you thought you were studying something previously and then you're, you're rethinking about it, that's going back into your working memory. So um, when you're replaying um, that event or situation um, in your mind, um, that's, you're kind of working on it, right? You're utilizing it, you're thinking about it, you're processing it. So that's your working memory. Excellent. So within uh, short-term and long-term, there's another classification, which is by declarative and procedural memories. So declarative memories are when you think of things that you declare or facts. So that's remembering names, um, events, situation, um, his historical dates. Versus procedural memory is... Um, as the name implies. So it's those memory formed around procedures. So um, the procedure of riding a bike or in the morning, um, you know, tying your shoes. So you're not necessarily constantly thinking about how to do those tasks because they become part of your procedural memory. Why is it important that we know the different types of memory? So it's not necessarily um, 
that essential to remember the different types, um, but they are stored differently in the brain. Um, so studies have shown that your declarative memory is found in your temporal lobe, particularly the hippocampus, um, whereas procedural memory are stored primarily in the cerebellum. Um, it's also important to note oftentimes with individuals with dementia, the procedural memory um, as you age is oftentimes what um, is the strongest or um, what is the most lasting. So in following articles, we'll probably be talking about procedural memory and how you can utilize that um, with individuals with dementia to help them learn new tasks or um, to remember to uh, continue their daily routine through their procedural memory. Gotcha. So whereas our declarative memories, like our facts are more here in the brain, temporal hippocampus, our procedural more in the back. So <laughs> that's probably going to matter when we start to feel like we're losing our memory, like you said, with patients with dementia, uh, is that different parts of the brain might change at different rates. Yes. So is memory loss a natural part of aging then? So uh, we all forget sometimes, right? Um, <laughs> it's natural um, and our brains uh, do change over time um, as we age. So when you look at the research, um, the overall volume of our brain um, starts to shrink as early as our 30s and 40s. Oh. Um, and then um, another shrinkage spikes within our 60s. Mm. Um, and so the area that tends to be most affected um, include those areas that store memory, such as the temporal lobe, as we talked about, the cerebellum and the hippocampus. Um, we also experience a decreased number of our uh, neural connections between those cells in our brain um, and a decreased number of connections um, contributes to greater difficulty with learning and memory. Mm. Also, there's studies that have found that um, as we age, we have a less production of chemicals in our brain, specifically dopamine and serotonin, which are considered our happy chemicals. We um, experience a release of those chemicals during like joyful or happy events. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we um, have more dopamine and serotonin, um, when we experience pleasant things such as, you know, eating or receiving a hug or um, exercising. So all those changes happen naturally in the brain. And so that can, can contribute to that, that memory loss of, oh, I, I know I know her name when, when you go to that party or, oh, where did I put my keys kind of thing. So those are normal experiences, we would say, of memory loss in life. And that there's not, there's not nothing we can do about it, but it, it's not that that is a sign of some kind of um, issue or neurological diagnosis. So what would be the difference maybe, or a reason that someone might really want to go get this checked out is if they feel like they're having significant memory loss, like how, how do we know the difference? Yeah, I would say when thinking about um, an individual um, that would receive like a diagnosis of dementia versus, um, you know, just aging memory loss. I think it's really important to look at how they're doing their daily routine. So I think um, when they're having a hard time making um, proper judgments, um, a key sign might be that they're getting lost. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily that they're forgetting, like almost tip of the tongue, if they're forgetting someone's name, that's very common. We oftentimes do that, or we have, um, we have a hard time maybe remembering a specific object, but I would think that you see a pattern of it. So you're seeing mm. a pattern of how their daily routine is. They might be forgetting um, very uh, vital or key components of that, such as getting lost or um, not remembering to take their medication. That's a really big one to pay attention to. I would say that that would be a good time to consult um, your primary care physician or a neurologist um, to kind of discuss what um, might be occurring um, with that. Okay, so the increased frequency along with the planning um, is gonna be what's making the difference between like, oh, I'm just forgetful and maybe there's something else going on. Yes. Okay. Kind of alluded to the answer to this question already, but can memory loss be prevented? 
So it's important to note, as I kind of said in the article, that there is um, a component of genetics with dementia and Alzheimer's, right? So um, I'm not saying that you can 100% prevent that type of diagnosis, um, but there are studies that have shown that there's things that we can decrease our risk of dementia and improve our memory. So that's what we um, would be focusing on the things that we can actually control with that. Um, and so with all of the brain changes we talk about, it's natural that remembering that phone number someone just told you or your granddaughter's friend's name may be more difficult, but that can be frustrating for people. So we don't want them to think they have to live that way. Studies have found that older adults who believe their memory is bad actually do worse on memory tests. So the first place to start is believing you can work on your memory. So almost believing in that mindset that that's something that you um, can work on, right? It's kind of the similar thing if someone came to you and said that they wanted to lose weight and if they have that mindset that they're not able to lose weight or they're not ex gonna exercise, well, they're probably not going to put in that motivation or effort to actually change. And so if you have that mindset that you can improve your memory or maintain your memory or grow and learn, then um, you will be able to succeed in that by implementing some tools and strategies because you'll be working on it and for focusing on it. Excellent. So belief is a big thing that just knowing that you can change things. Memory is not just set in stone as, oh, I have a bad memory and that's it. It's something we have to work on just like everything else we do. That makes sense. And like we talked about before with aging, we tend to see less communication between our neurons. So mm. something that can help increase their activity is increasing the challenge to our brain. And the hippocampus, which helps us create new memories, is located close to our emotion center of our brain called the amygdala. I think we can all think of an example of a really happy memory. It's like we have that memory because the more emotionally charged it is, the more likely our brain is going to create and store that memory which is why I highly recommend finding ways to um, increase your memory through your meaningful daily activities. Okay. So in your article, I loved when you first touched on Sudoku and word puzzles. So I get a lot of clients or family members too that say, oh, I need to do more puzzles to increase my brain. So can you talk a little bit about that? Do we have to do Sudoku? <laughs> The answer is no, um, but if you love it and you like to do it, then I would say go for it. What I feel like is the most important part to help your memory is to find activities um, that stimulate your brain that you love to do, because if you love to do it, you're going to engage in it more. Um, and also, as we talked about with um, the hippocampus near the amygdala, if you're engaging in an activity that is causes you to be happy or that you have like a saliency to it, you're going to be more likely to form those memories. So we want to actually engage in something that is interesting and fascinating to you. So if you love Sudoku, then go for it. But at the same time, I don't want people just doing brain activities to do them. It's like, why don't we find something that is challenging that you love to do? Because that's going to be ultimately what allows you to establish a routine of doing that in your daily life. Gotcha. Could you list just a couple um, examples of that? And our article, Katie lists a number of them. So definitely check that out. But just, just to give people just watching the video, just a couple examples of how they can incorporate memory challenge into their daily activities. <laughs> it's interesting because I used my mom as an example for this because it's something that her and I had a conversation about her memory um, probably a couple of years ago. And I can see that she incorporates a lot of this in it. So something she loves to do is she loves to cook. So she loves to try a new recipe and a great way to work on your memory with that is you take the list to the store and you try to remember all of the things on the list and gather those items before return, referring to the list. And it's also mm -hmm. a challenge in itself to have to follow a new recipe, um, learn a new type of cuisine. Um, all of that is using your processing skills. Um, for sewing and, knit and knitting, um, attempting a new pattern or challenging yourself with something that requires you to be more engaged, right? Because when you're learning something new, 
um, you're having to use a lot more processing skills, right? Um, such as with knitting a new pattern, right? Um, you're having to think a lot on it versus when you've gotten used to the pattern, it might have translated to your procedural memory, right? You're able to watch TV mm. as you're doing the pattern, you're not thinking about it. But when you're learning something new, you're using your brain a lot, um, just because um, you've never experienced it before. So trying anything new is such a great way to do it. Um, so that's like the challenge that you talked about before, where it's creating that the need for connection between the neurons, they have to communicate with each other to get this new process going in the brain. Yes. Awesome. Exactly. Okay. And I know we didn't, I didn't heavily touch on this in the article, but something to point out is um, the power of social participation. So you can mm. challenge your brain with a number of these activities, um, but in adding on like a social component um, significantly helps with improvement of memory, right? So when you're interacting with other people, um, you're dialoguing, you're engaging, you're contemplating new ideas. Um, so there's the engagement piece in the daily activities, but if you can also supplement that with um, social participation, that in itself is huge. And the article that's attached, I believe it's called, um, Are We Engaged? by mm -hmm. uh, the CDC that talks more about social participation. So it's also important to note that as well. That sounds too like what I call like a bang for your buck exercise where you're not only challenging yourself, increasing that neuron communication, but you're also possibly increasing that dopamine serotonin because you're having positive interaction. So mm -hmm. that sounds like social engagement is really another key to brain health as well. Yes. Excellent. Any final thoughts, Katie Fisher, on how to improve our memory? Yes. So I think... In summary, it just has to do with taking care of your overall health, right? Mm -hmm. um, exercise is a huge component of not just your physical health, but your brain health as well. So exercising, eating healthy, um, another huge component is sleep. Um, research has found if you can't focus because you're tired, you can't concentrate enough, concentrate enough to form um, a memory, right? And I often mm -hmm. see this a lot of times with my clients in the hospital, right? Because they're sleep deprived from having so many people come in and out, all of the noises, they're not in their, their same bed. And you can see how that's impacting their ability to learn new memory in our therapy. So sleep is a vital component um, to it. And we already talked about the social participation. So um, the CDC also provides just risk factors associated with dementia. So some of that might include like high blood pressure, um, diabetes, those types of things. I would look into that um, and just kind of see, is any of this controllable? Anything I can talk to you, my primary care physician about? Because some of those controllable factors at least can lower your risk factor overall if you might have um, more genetic factors at play. All right. Well, Katie Fisher... Thank you so much, our senior centered OT. We really appreciate it. And I know I'm going to try to uh, remember my list in the grocery store. That's something I always struggle with. So that's something that's going to be a good challenge for me as well. So we really hope that you enjoyed watching this video and you learned something from it and that you're going to take something you learned and use it in your daily activities and help improve your memory. So if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please remember to subscribe and also check out our blog, www.theseniorcenteredpt.com and www.theseniorcenteredot.com. I'm Dr. Katie, the Senior Centered Physical Therapist. And I'm Katie Fisher, the Senior Centered Occupational Therapist. And thank you guys for watching. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.